Uh, so yeah, heritage grains in contemporary agriculture. Uh, what are we doing here, right? Let's let's run through a little bit of this real quick. The what, the who, the why, and where is this going when we talk about heritage grains uh, in contemporary agriculture? And of course, relating this to the Scandinavian story as well. Now I was born and raised in Decorah, uh, and I'm from here. So some of the insights you're going to hear today uh, are a little bit more localized to this region, but can certainly be uh, connected to anywhere that you live, and we'll talk about that as we go. Let's talk about what heritage grains are. What do these look like? Heritage grains are genetically diverse varieties of wheat, rye, barley, oats, things like that, that were grown before the introduction of uh, intensive uh, scientific plant breeding in the early 1900s. Now, sometimes some of these things are also known as ancient grains uh, or even as landrace crops, uh, and those are often adapted to poor soils or different soil types uh, and difficult growing conditions in specific regions regions all over the world, could be anywhere. So that's really what we're talking about when we look at heritage grains. Some examples of those, uh, early varieties of wheat. So uh, wheat, of course, uh, coming from the breadbasket of the world, the Middle East and Eastern Africa and ancient Africa. But varieties of wheat we might be talking about would include spelt, uh, Corazon wheat, which is also known as kamut in today's world, einkorn or emmer. Uh, when we look at the Scandinavian story, Barley is certainly at the top of the list for one of the grains that was seen in uh, uh, early parts of Scandinavia. Oats, sorghum, teff, and millet, which are, of course, uh, famous from uh, ancient Africa and uh, the Middle East. Pseudo cereals like quinoa, amaranth, buckwheat, and chia. And I always like to make sure we include in this conversation uh, open pollinated varieties of corn. That would be really any uh, ancient variety of corn. Uh, or maize, of course, uh, from our uh, ancestors in uh, Central or Southern America. Um, so those are just some examples of heritage grains and sort of what we're talking about when we come up with uh, that term of uh, 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 heritage grains are ancient grains and we're talking about. Again, who and why heritage grains? What am I doing here talking to you all today? Thank you for being here, by the way. Uh, I am Benji Nichols. I'm a Decora native. Uh, both sides of my maternal grandmother's family traced back to Norway, immigrating in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, I had the immense uh, opportunity to visit Norway in 2018 with my own mother uh, and see the region, the Toten region, the eastern part of Norway, where uh, most of her family was from. Inland County uh, near Aina Vatnet or Lake Aina, uh, the small town of Lena. Uh, if you're not familiar with that part of Norway, uh, the eastern part of Norway is the agricultural region of Norway still to this day. Lots of rolling hills, beautiful scenery, uh, not so much the mountainous country that we think of a lot of times when we think of Norway, but this is the part of Norway that is still farmable. Lots and lots of agriculture, everything from vegetables, carrots, onions, potatoes to the grains we're talking about today uh, and, and other things. So a really beautiful part of the country. I was born in Decorah. I graduated high school here in the mid 1990s. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to school in Boston, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Berkeley College of Music. As Andrew hinted to, uh, what does any good holder of a Bachelor of Music degree do uh, but move sight unseen to the West Coast? Uh, it turns out I had a very good friend uh, who was having uh, their first child with her husband, uh, also ran a bakery in Santa Rosa, California. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. She was uh, an exquisite baker, uh, very interesting, really on the forefront of a lot of what she was doing around the year 2000, still uh, on the West Coast, but brick oven baking. It was an opportunity that I took as just a little break from my career in uh, the music production world. Uh, and it's something that's become a lifelong passion that I, uh, I love to talk about. So heritage grains uh, and baking is kind of where I come from in the story, but there's so many other pieces to it. We're going to explore some of those. Uh, in the next slide, I do have a quick view too. I always like to show. This is from uh, the Toten region in Norway. It's a great picture of a grain field, you know, those big rolling hills. Uh, this would have been late fall. So a little bit different than the U.S. in terms of uh, when they see harvest on some things, uh, but a beautiful part of the country if you ever get to visit uh, and a very, uh, very fun part of things. Uh, the intersections of heritage grains. It's kind of what I like to frame this conversation as. What are we coming from? As I mentioned, I come, at, come from it a lot of times from a baking perspective. Um, but what's interesting about grains is we can follow grains all the way back in civilization. I will go through a brief history here in a minute. Uh, and I very self-admittedly, I am, I am not an expert in history or world history, but I have uh, learned a lot about uh, small grains and about these heritage grains and the uses that we're doing with them. The culture, of course, that is a 
attached to those is all across the world. Uh, there have been amazing cultures across the world that are all tied to grain and civilization. That's how civilization has come to be, is through those grains uh, over thousands of years. Agriculture, of course, and the entire story of agriculture, particularly modern agriculture in the U.S. and how it ties to the immigrant story, is a huge part of this conversation as well. Uh, community, of course, follows all of those things. Anywhere you had agriculture, you had community because you had to have community uh, over the centuries in order to be able to exist and uh, work on a farm and run a farm. One of the parts of the conversation we'll get into a little bit later is what the environment looks like around grains and especially the reintroduction of heritage grains in the U.S., uh, particularly in the last 10 to 20 years and what that uh, can do, the possibilities of it, the, the benefits of uh, growing some of these grains and how we look at them. And of course, just history in general, which is going to bring me to. Now, don't be afraid when we see uh, this next uh, couple slides, but you know, where is this going? The story of agriculture in Norwegian America uh, and Norwegian immigration to America is one of uh, new beginnings, re-envisioning possibility. You know, why in the mid 1800s did those first folks decide that they were taking the risk to come halfway around the world for new beginnings? Uh, as we look at heritage grains and the use of them in our food systems, you know, now we are seeing heritage grains drive new sectors uh, of local food economies and agriculture. Uh, we're seeing new opportunities that are once again appearing because those who are kind of willing to take some risks around the edges uh, so to create some opportunities um, to exist for producers in this world uh, in modern agriculture culture again. But really, at the end of the day, what I like to point out is that uh, the best part of this conversation is that, you know, Scandinavian rye breads are delicious, uh, as are local beers made with local grains or local breads made with local grains. Uh, and those are both from incredible producers to things that you can work on yourself, uh, which we might talk about in future future uh, opportunities. So that's kind of where we're going today, talking about this story of grains. A very, very, very brief history. I don't bring this up to be a world scholar. I bring this up to give us a context in time. Uh, and again, if we look at where I'm beginning in time, let's call it the Bronze Age, 3300 BC. There was certainly civilization before this. And if we look at the long history of grains, that history was coming out of the Middle East. It was coming out of Africa. It was coming out of places that have been growing grains for thousands and thousands of years. But for our sake in this conversation, we're going to look starting at the Bronze Age, 3300 to 1200 BC. This is kind of a pre-farming age, especially when you look at Scandinavia, a lot of subsistence living. Now, barley is one of the earliest things to show up in that conversation. Barley being important for many reasons, but that was a grain that could grow successfully in Scandinavia and found many, many uses uh, from porridges to early forms of a fermented beer to all sorts of things. But barley shows up very, very early in the picture. As we look towards what we refer to in history as the Iron Age, so 1200 to 600, still BC, we see some traces of farming begin. In Scandinavia, we see those social clans starting to form around different parts of Scandinavia and what that looks like. We also see some other things start to show up like rye, rye being another grain, very important in the history of Scandinavia. I like to refer to the Roman Age, uh, right before 750 BC into 475, you know, Common Era or AD, as we might call it. Uh, and here we really start to see Scandinavian ties using grain. Uh, there are stories as you look back in history of Scandinavians making their way to the Roman culture. Uh, some of those people were soldiers. Some of those people were sailors, early sailors, uh, pre-Vikings almost in this time still. Uh, but again, we start to see rye. We start to see the use of barley. We even see oats show up around this time. Uh, oats, when they were first found, even being referred to as a weed, not really realizing what they had quite at first and that could be used as a, a food and uh, animal source. But the time of the Vikings comes up. We're looking at 800 to 1050 AD. And why is this important? The Vikings, as we all know, were some of the first off of the Scandinavian contents, uh, continents to really start making their way across Europe, across the world, even as we might know. And it's really interesting as they start to interact, what happens in Scandinavia? Uh, the pagan beliefs of these times or the time of the Vikings start to transition. We see Christianity come in. This is the time of some of the famous stave churches in Norway uh, that you may be familiar with if you've traveled or followed some of Westerheim's other uh, uh, programs and historical pieces. The reason that's important as we look at our next slide is really up to this time, we see very, very primitive living in Scandinavia. 
As we look a little further into history, 1100 to 1300, sometimes this is referred to as the golden age of Norway. This is where farming, as we somewhat think of it, really comes to be. Trade is common in Norway. Farming starts to be common. We see culture coming to light. We see a lot of things happening in these years, in these couple of centuries. But we can think of grains really coming to the forefront and having a major, major part of the culture, a major part of the food source, and of course, enabling any type of livestock to be available uh, that they could feed feed and then use in their feed uh, and food sources as well. Worth pointing out, 1349 in Norway, the Black Death reaches Norway. Uh, they lose a third of their population. This sets the country back significantly. Uh, Union is uh, formed during this time. As you know, if uh, some of you are familiar with your Norwegian history, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, we've got a lot of very complicated history throughout the next couple of centuries. <laughs> But as you look through the 1500s to the 1800s, we have some famine, we have some really rough pieces of history, but then we see the country start to grow. We see a population boom start to happen through uh, getting towards the 1800s in Norway. We see mining become uh, a major source of uh, industry in the country. We see a lot of logging and milling where it's possible in Norway. And all along, farming is growing during this time too, where it's possible in Norway. Uh, now, that's a really important piece of our next puzzle because uh, Norwegian Constitution Day, set in Demai, as a lot of us know, May 17th, 1814. So we have covered an enormous amount of time here in a very short amount. Uh, let's just call it 5,000 years for the sake of, uh, for the sake of today's conversation. By 1825, the Great Migration begins from Norway. Immigrants coming to the U.S. looking for opportunity. Why does this happen? A lot of you probably already know this that there's been a population boom in Norway. There's a lot of lack of opportunity for those folks in Norway. If you're in a family of, let's say, six or eight or 12 siblings in Norway, when the farm is gonna come down uh, in history or in time or to the next generation, it's gonna come down to the oldest male sibling. What does that mean if you're the third oldest male sibling? Well, it means you better be looking for work. <laughs> It's for some people, it meant there was still opportunity on the family farm. For a lot of people, it meant that you were going to be a tenant farmer, a cotter. You were going to be looking for opportunities. Uh, if you were a female at that point in time, your opportunities were very limited, of course. But because of those reasons, we see uh, some of the lack of opportunity, uh, the lack of agricultural space in Norway, and of course, the whole story of religious freedom from what's going on in Norway. Essentially, the church is the government. And if you have different ideas, you're looking for opportunities. So this is the Great Migration, 1825. It begins by 1930 in just about a century. Uh, we see 800,000 immigrants come from Norway to the U.S. This is important to our conversation particularly here in the Midwest, of our part of the Midwest, uh, for all those Norwegian immigrants that made their way here. Um, it's really important for me to po point out, too, that we're really looking at a sliver of time and a sliver of culture, right? Uh, because during this time, we have influences. We have German and Russian and Slavic and Mediterranean and Middle Eastern and African influences coming from all over the world, uh, reaching different parts of Europe. So I'm glossing over a lot. But again, the point I'm really trying to make from you know uh, the Bronze Age and earlier from 3000 years BC up until this point of the Great Migration, we've really been looking at very basic means of farming but with these grains at the heart of it. 1905, Norway gains full independence from Denmark and Sweden as our last little brief history moment. Those early immigrant farms we talked to. In my next slide here, we're gonna look at sort of what that means to be an early immigrant farmer in the US. For those folks that found their way probably through New York, maybe over the Great Lakes or uh, through other waterways, found their way up the Mississippi to our part of the world here in the upper Midwest. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, a lot of other parts of the West, as the uh, Western expansion happened, were settled and where Scandinavians found their way. But here in Northeast Iowa, Southeast Minnesota, of course, being a very early settler spot for a lot of those immigrants. Uh, those Scandinavian immigrant farms that we uh, think of are very similar to kind of what we imagine as a small farm, right? Uh, a single cow or two, maybe a pig or two, a flock of chickens. You would grow uh, several varieties of grain. If you were a small farmer, you would grow whatever people were saying you could grow here. Uh, and again, that might mean you know anything from barley to rye to oats to wheat uh, to corn. Wheat, one example, I do want to point out that through our history there in Scandinavia, wheat was very much considered a luxury uh grain. Wheat was not as common. And that's why we talk a lot about these early heritage varieties of grains. Again, barley, rye, oats, corn, uh, some of those things. 
they're really important. But on these small immigrant farms, they were sustenance. They were how we existed. They were our food sources in uh, just about everything we were doing. Now, on a small farm, you can grow different things. You can feed them to a lot of livestock. But if you want to use them in your own home, if you want to use them for food, there's a very important piece to this puzzle. And that would be a local mill. Now, local mills come up because uh, every community, every small farming community would have had to have access to a mill of some sort. In uh, uh, this slide here that we have, I have kind of a fun picture. Uh, this is the Springwater Mill, which was uh, located just outside of Decorah and what would have been the small community of Springwater. This picture is dated from 1913. Uh, as you can see, the mill had been uh, constructed sometime before then. You can see it was already uh, fairly well used by the time this picture was taken. Uh, this happens to be several of my relatives standing outside of the Springwater Mill in 1913. Uh, they were on my mother's side of the family. Uh, but from her father, so they were on the Stortz side by then. Uh, but it's very interesting. This mill uh, was built in the turn of the century, uh, I believe, by the Beard family. There's a couple pieces of history that go into this. The Beard's a local family that are well known. Uh, some of you might know of Luna Valley Pizza Farm, uh, or as well as the Beard family, uh, longtime Organic Valley milkers in this region. Lots of long routes to this. What's interesting about this story is that a local mill was how you would have taken your grains and turned them into food. Uh, stone mills, you're talking about two big stones that ground together. They were powered only by water. It was the only way you would have powered something like this at the time. So you had to be on a small waterway. Now, a true small mill like this would have also been a real community focal point in your part of, uh, of uh, rural America. A community mill like this, located on the Canoe Creek, uh, is also uh, near Springwater Lutheran Church, of course. It was very one of the oldest, older churches in our part of Winnesheet County here in Northeast Iowa. You can find examples of these types of grist mills all across rural America, right? So local milling, but those early farmers needed to have those mills available so they could grind their grain uh, not only for animal use and crack grains, but also for human use. Uh, if you could grow your grains, that's great. But if you had no way to process them, they weren't nearly as useful to you. Uh, so this is the earliest parts of being able to make a corn meal or a, uh, a grain meal or a flour. Uh, small stones, again, in these mills, they existed all over countrysides, uh, running, running sources of water to turn those stones. It's interesting here in Northeast Iowa, uh, there's been sort of a resurgence of interest in this history. There is well over 30 local grist mills that were documented. And I was just told this week that there's actually better proof of around 70 different mills of different types uh, turn of the century that were in existence just here in our little part of the country where Vesterheim is. Uh, but again, these were owned by other farmers. This was something you might have in addition to your farm if you were an entrepreneur or somebody looking to get bigger. Over time, these were very complicated pieces of the puzzle to run as well because uh, money was very, very tight and people didn't have a lot of money to spend necessary. So as the miller, perhaps what you got for milling someone else's grain was a cut of the grain you were milling. It's very helpful to feed livestock or your family. Doesn't do a lot to pay your bills over time. So there's different parts to that puzzle that uh, happen over time. But again, these are owned by uh, you know people who are looking to, to keep building and to uh, help their neighbors from small to big. All of this uh, that we're talking about, of course, would have been uh, from the grains, the heritage grains. But anything that would have been ground in these mills, of course, we're talking about a whole grain flour. So a little tiny piece of grain has lots of parts to it. And in those mills, it's two big stone wheels. You just grind those up and what comes out is what you get. When we think of white flour in today's world, which we'll talk a little bit more in, uh, in later, you're talking about a sifted product. So what we're talking about is a very whole grain flour. This is pretty, pretty intense stuff. So you're very, pretty crunchy, crunchy uh, flour that you'd be using. But this is what uh, a lot of our early immigrants were counting on. Uh, and again, essential pieces of the food supply uh, and, and grain usage in our area. Another fun example is uh, the Bernatz, uh, Painter Bernatz Mill at the Vesterheim campus. If you've been to Vesterheim, you're familiar with this building. It's a landmark in Decora for us. This mill was built in 1851 as a flour mill by William Painter. Interesting, was an early English settler in Decora, so he can't give the Norwegians all the credit on this one. But uh, the upper story was added in 1890. It's kind of an interesting building, some interesting history. And again, at that time, the Upper Iowa River came directly by this building and powered those millstones. Uh, and this was a major source for flour in Decora in the early days uh, and a food source, again, for cracking those grains, for grinding those grains. Uh, an interesting piece of history, the Upper Iowa was moved uh, 
In about 1947, the Corps of Engineers project that happened in Decorah, this continued in commercial use until 1964. So again, over a century of history in a lot of these mills uh, through time. And that about is when the uh, Westerheim um, entity was able to absorb this into the museum. And, uh, and that's a whole other part of Westerheim's story. So if you get to visit the campus, you can see that mill. It's a really interesting piece of history here in Decorah specifically. A little bit different part of the story, grains in the U.S. in general. Now, again, we've talked about a lot of different types of heritage grains, right? What are we talking about? Native Americans, of course, were here long before the immigrants got here. They were slowly figuring out what, you know, not slowly, but they had figured out what a lot of the things were here already that could be used. Now, corn isn't exactly part of that picture necessarily, but when you look at grasses, you look at wild rices as we know them, they're just a type of grass. That's all that is. So a lot of that would have been north of us a bit in Minnesota, but there are a lot of different things that the immigrants might have been learning from early Native Americans and also the early uh, fur traders, the other folks that were here as far as early as the 1600s in the Midwest. We look at places like Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, settled uh, at least in the 1600s by uh, French fur traders and others who were working on the Mississippi. You know, some interesting pieces of history there. Wheat being part of this story, but comes in a little bit later for the Midwest. Uh, the 1600s, uh, wheat is being grown in New England, as we know. So very early on the East Coast, uh, as far as Western expansion in Western Mississippi and in, in the frame of our Norwegian immigrant friends, uh, you know, Lots of lots of wheat growing early on in the U.S., but that hasn't really reached the Midwest until a little bit later. Uh, the pioneers, the immigrant groups that were coming across, of course, brought some of those things with them. Also worth pointing out, which we're going to talk a little bit more with a, on the kind of timeline of bread in the U.S. in just a second, is that anything that would have been made at this point from the grains we're talking about, any type of bread that would have been made would have been what we effectively know as the sourdough or made from a sourdough culture. So, of course, there was no commercial yeast until the mid-1860s. Uh, so anything we're talking about that would have been made from a flour that was ground in a small mill in a rural community would have still been either put together as a porridge or a sourdough starter of some sort. Uh, so it's kind of a fun thing to keep in mind that thousands and thousands of years of history uh, before we get to commercial yeast. Each immigrant group, of course, bringing their own foods as well. And as we see in terms of bread or grains, you know, that looks like breads and flatbreads. Um, of course, all sorts of different immigrant groups have uh, different examples of that, uh, pastas and rices, and then brewing, which of course I like to point out because it's one of the more fun parts of this story. Wheat, barley, and hops are what go into brewing. Lots of part of uh, parts of Europe had centuries and thousands of years of history on that. Uh, the Scandinavians also have their own rich history in brewing. Uh, Westerheim is uh, focusing on a couple of those things more uh, in, in the near future, even featuring a trip that may get mentioned later uh, for contemporary beers in Norway, so you can keep your ears out for that one. But what's interesting about that part of the story is that most small farms, a lot of Scandinavian farms, had an early form of what we would call beer being brewed again from barley or some of those grains that were available, used during celebrations or other things, but very much a farmhouse style beer, kind of where some of that terminology comes from. If we start to look at the rise of industrial agriculture in the US, this is a really important part of the story. As we've mentioned pretty quickly, uh, where we've had, you know, let's call it 5,000 years of history getting to this point. If we look at the early 1900s in the US, the 1930s, you know, just right on the edge of uh, the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, a lot of those things, the figures say we had somewhere around 6.8 million farms in the US. Uh, if you look into the 1940s, uh, it's always fun for us here in Northeast Iowa. Norman Borlaug, of course, was from Cresco, Iowa, here in Northeast Iowa. Uh, but the time of Norman Borlaug working in the Green Revolution, we look from the mid 1940s all the way up through the 70s. Uh, Norman, uh, Mr. Borlaug doing a lot of his work in Mexico, but we're working on types of grains, types of small grains, types of wheat that could successfully grow in other places and feed more people. So you kind of see the beginnings of industrial agriculture. Uh, by the time we get to the 1970s, of course, uh, and especially in the Midwest, a lot of us are aware of this, but by the 1970s, the, the word on the street or on the gravel road, as it might have been, was really get big or get out. Uh, you know, if you were in agriculture and you were growing grains, you were growing something, the word was you had to get bigger. You couldn't have a small farm and grow lots of different types of things. You needed to think about commodities. You needed to think about corn or soybeans or some of those things. Now, this isn't a bad thing. I don't point it out as a negative because through the work of Norman Borlaug, through the work of growing agriculture and all of the technology that's gone into it, we have figured out 
out how to feed a growing world. What's interesting about it, though, if you look at the Great Depression and afterwards, small family farms begin to get bigger and focus on commodities or they disappear. And by the time we get to the farm crisis of the 1980s, especially here in the upper Midwest, uh, we see the number of family farms in the U.S. shrinking immensely. Uh, during a short time in the 1980s, in terms of right in our area, the figure is uh, upwards of 250,000 farms that were lost in a very short amount of time. 1935, 6.8 million farms. By 1990, uh, really less than 60 years later, we're at just over 2 million farms in the U.S. So we've lost over a third, uh, or two thirds, I'm sorry, of our, of our small family farms in the U.S. Now, again, industrial agriculture taking a lot of, of, of uh, growth and a lot of technology and helping feed the world. But when we talk about heritage grains, it means we have lost an immense amount of history, an immense amount of uh, variety and what is being grown across the US landscape. So uh, my next slide here, I like to throw out a pretty bread picture slide. This was a picture I took uh, when I was in Norway of one of the many breakfasts, a nice whole grain bread there, uh, something that's a common sight in Norway. And at this point, we'll take a quick timeline of bread in the US. Now, I like to point these dates out because they're uh, pretty interesting. As I mentioned, you know, when we started looking at those roughly 5,000 years of history, if you look back to the beginnings of fermentation, maybe even in uh, ancient Africa and the Middle East, by uh, you know, 5,000 years later, in 1868, the Fleischmann brothers uh, managed to create commercially available yeast. Now, this really changes what we're looking at, because again, we're talking about things having been uh, naturally leavened, having essentially been created from sourdoughs for thousands of years. In 19, early 1860s, uh, we all of a sudden see commercially available yeast. 1969, Harvard chemist Eben Horsford creates baking powder, of course, creating a whole nother level of uh, easier technology for baking. In the 1870s, we see a real uh, stronger introduction of steel roller mills. Now, we were talking about the uh, stone mills that would have existed uh, up until this time. Steel roller mills giving us the technology to really be able to not only grind down those grains, but we also have sifting technology come in. So we are starting to create what we kind of know as a white flour, again, 1870s. Uh, by the 1920s, Chillicothe Baking Company is selling what else but sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting piece of completely random history. Uh, the slicer of uh, sliced bread was invented by an Iowan. His name was Otto Rowetter. Uh, it's a random piece of history, but I always have to laugh when that comes up. Uh, 1950s, of course, we're seeing mass-produced bread across the U.S. Uh, lots of folks, and again, I have to say, lots of other cultural groups hanging on to their roots of you know long baking traditions. You know, and you look across uh, French culture, Italian culture, you know, European uh, groups, and others who have held on to their baking uh, knowledge. But, you know, again, seeing those mass produced breads, that kind of sliced wonder bread idea coming about in the 1950s and 60s, uh, even into the, the later times. In the U.S. specifically, I like to point out the 1970s and 80s, seeing a very renewed interest in brick oven baking and, and sourdough baking. By 2000, we see an explosion in grassroots baking and including the heritage grains use, which I think is a really important piece of the puzzle. A quick fun slide of some beautiful sourdough bread uh, being bred on kind of the newer bread landscape that we talk about. Uh, in the few folks I like to point out really quickly in this part of the puzzle, uh, because through the 80s and 90s here in the U.S. is when you really start to see kind of a new bread landscape. Um, so I've got a few folks that I always like to point out. There's a couple uh, that are often pointed to by real bread geeks uh, in Vermont in the late 1970s, Jules and Helen Rabin. Um, they're an amazing older couple uh, that had a stone oven that they baked out of for decades. Uh, incredible, incredible use of heritage grains that were grown in the Northeast and beautiful, beautiful uh, hearth breads that they created uh, back in the 70s, kind of on the early side of what we call craft baking. Uh, in the 80s, early 80s, we see on both coasts, larger upstarts really taking an interest in, in different grains and like in creating beautiful, beautiful breads that are going to be uh, looked at in terms of kind of craft baking. Uh, Acme bread in 1983 in Los Angeles, bread alone. I get the same year in upstate New York, get a lot of credit. La Brea Bakery on the West Coast and later in the 80s in Los Angeles is the first to mass distribute uh, what we call like a par baked bread partially baked bread. So all of a sudden you can get a beautiful artisan bread in your grocery store, finish baking it at home and sort of understand that. 
Another gentleman I like to point out is Alan Scott, who was a Tasmanian of all things, uh, but he uh, wrote a book uh, in the 90s called The Bread Builders. He wrote that with another baker, Daniel Wing. Uh, Alan was known all across California for building brick ovens, uh, very specific brick oven designs. Um, and it was kind of uh, one of the forefathers for what we call a modern sort of a, a boom in the brick oven baking scene in the U.S. here from the 1990s on. Um, his plan were used wide and far across the U.S. for lots of folks. Even right here in Decorah, there was one built at one time uh, at McCaffrey's Dolce Vita. If anyone is familiar with the restaurant, that was an Alan Scott design oven uh, and is still there. It's a Twin Springs Supper Club now, but it's an interesting piece. I always like to point this part of the story out because this is how I ended up in California in the 2000s and interested in this conversation. Uh, this continued interest in locally grown heritage grains for baking. I have a fun slide up next. This is a black and white photo of me. It wasn't that long ago. I'm not sure why we were using black and white film, but it must have been fun. This was Grindstone Bakery circa 2000 in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, my friend Tana Riggins Ruiz uh, ran Grindstone. Uh, really interesting bakery. We ground all of our flour from whole grains. Uh, we were using all sorts of ancient grains uh, from across the spectrum that she was able to source from across across uh, uh, different parts of the West in California, uh, grinding our own grains, mixing our own doughs by hand, sourdoughs, uh, almost entirely modern wheat free, if I would say that. A lot of the ancient varieties of wheat, some interesting things, all brick oven baked, fire powered. Uh, that was the era of blackouts, rolling blackouts through California uh, via PG&E. We often laugh because the fan would go off and the lights would go off and we'd keep right on baking what we were working on. Uh, but where a lot of my knowledge came from with Heritage Grains was at that time and working hands-on with those grains, which was really amazing experience for me uh, to see how these things work. Okay, why do we care about this? We're going to connect heritage back to agriculture. Great products, great food products come from great ingredients. And great ingredients have to come from great grains. I mean, that's really the root of it. Any kind of food product you want, the better your ingredients are, the better your outcome is going to be. One of the other points we've covered is that farms were getting bigger. And huge farms, bigger farms equal efficiency. Now that's really, really good for feeding masses of people. We can create a lot of, you know, commodity grains in less space with less time and less energy. And that's good for humanity in a lot of ways, but it doesn't do so much for heritage grains and some of those things we figured out over time. Heritage, ancient artisan grains, call them whatever you like, really have to come a lot of times from smaller producers. Uh, a lot of times they came from smaller producers because that's really the environment that those grains thrived in, right? They couldn't grow them in thousands of acre fields. They came from an, a small field in a, in a specific area that had a, a different biome around it, right? Challenges exist with this model uh, for smaller producers. Challenges exist, of course, if you don't have a market for these grains readily, or if you have to truck them farther or take them further or pick them a certain way, that means you have to handle them differently. It takes more time, more energy, more money, but it gives us a little bit more unique piece of the puzzle as well. Opportunities exist uh, in this day and age, but you know, to grow these smaller, uh, these types of grains, these heritage grains, uh, you, we have smaller producers and we have to create markets for them. The one way I like to explain this a lot of times is that it's sort of a craft beer model. If you've followed what's happened with craft beer over the last 10, 15, 20 years, to me, it's really where we're at with heritage grains, sort of right here in the last several years, where, you know, these things are happening. There's parts of the country where they're happening a lot more. There's parts of the country where they're not happening at all, but there's an interest in them. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see more and more and more interest in this as we bring these local heritage grains back into parts and pockets of the U.S. to create really amazing foodstuffs. Um, so at this part, I, I want to introduce one friend of mine. Uh, there's two folks coming up that we're going to talk to. Todd Suko is a farmer. Todd is a friend of mine. He lives just outside of Wacan, Iowa, just a few miles to the east of us here in Decora and Vesterheim. Uh, Todd is someone I've gotten to know really well uh, as he started growing some trials of grains a few years ago when I was poking around with who else was talking about this right here in Northeast Iowa. Uh, Todd has also looked at the process of sort of harvesting and handling these grains and what that means for transportation and, and markets and some of those things. Uh, and Todd is just an all around very knowledgeable small farmer here in our region and has a lot of amazing background. So I'd like to introduce Todd for a second and let him tell you a little bit about what he's done on his farm. Welcome, Todd. Thanks, Benji. Um, appreciate the opportunity to visit with all of you today. Uh, just have a few slides. 
wanted to start on this one. This is combine I started with. It's kind of an antique. It's a 59 International. Um, this is in a field of spelt. So that's one of the heritage grains that Benji mentioned previously. Uh, I had very good yield on this. I had about 100 bushels to an acre. Now spelt is a hulled grain. So that means that there is a large uh, covering over the actual seed. However, that works well for using it for feed. We're using it primarily for horse feed right now, but there's also quite a bit of uh, potential in the brewing industry with this particular grain. Um, if we go to the next slide, this particular uh, crop I'm in here is actually Kernza, which is not a heritage grain, but we'll talk about it a little bit at the end. It's a new grain that's being tried as a perennial crop. Uh, you can also see I've upgraded the combine a little bit. It's still old, but it's at least a 1980 now. So uh, this is uh, the main workhorse for getting the grain out of the field. Uh, on our next slide here, we can see the examples of rye and winter wheat. Um, rye is the grain that I started out with uh, trying. Right now, there's a kind of a renaissance in rye growth for the cover crop industry. It's an excellent uh, grain to put in in the fall. It scavenges, it scavenges nitrogen, also helps prevent soil erosion over the winter time. I also seed it in for a neighbor who calves on it in the springtime, so the growth helps uh, lessen the mud problems while he's calving. Uh, obviously, also it has a lot of uses in um, in the bread business and along with um, some brewing and some distilling as well. It gives kind of a characteristic spicy taste in whiskeys if you're a fan of those. Uh, the winter wheat, actually Winnishie County back in the 1870s was one of the leading producers of wheat in the United States. That went away because of disease and uh, insect pressure and also the advent of corn. However, I tried it a couple of years ago. We had good yields. Uh, we ran both the rye and the winter wheat through a lab in Kansas City to check it for food grade viability. And our numbers came up well, which told me that we can grow this type of grain quite nicely in this region. Uh, take a look at the next slide. Here we have the spelt on the left, and you can see how puffy that grain looks. That's actually the hull. Now, the the grain itself would be about BB size in the midst of that hull. So there's a lot of excess material on that. Um, on the right is a grain called Kernza. And while that's technically not a heritage grain, as we're discussing today, it is kind of an exciting extension of small grain technology. Uh, this particular uh, grain has been bred from intermediate wheatgrass stock that originated in the Black Sea area by the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. And a group of the neighbors and myself are experimenting with that right now. Uh, the real advantage of it is that it's a perennial grain so that you seed it once and you can get up to three years of harvest from one seeding. Uh, roots also extend to about 10 feet in depth, so it's wonderful for soil erosion and nutrient scavenging uh, abilities. and Another advantage is that from the uh, picture of my second combine, you could see how it was green underneath yet. That was after harvest. You can actually harvest the straw and use it for forage for cattle. So it's a multi-dimensional um, crop. You can get the grain and then you can still use it for hay or pasture. And we're on the early end of this, but uh, it's kind of an exciting development as well. So uh, like I say, there's a group of us over here giving some experimentation to these various crops, and uh, we're optimistic for the future. Um, and with that, that's about all I got, I guess, Benji. Yeah. Thank you so much, Todd. I love having your perspective as someone who's actually growing some of these grains right here in our region. And of course, uh, as I've mentioned, there are other parts of the country that are ahead of the curve on this and that have really put in some time and energy. There are other parts of the country uh, that are not as far ahead or that are just you know figuring out what works in a specific region. And so it really takes producers like Todd who are willing to take the risk to say, I've got an acre, we can try this, we can look at what happens and see if it's viable for a bigger, uh, a bigger project of some sort. If you have projects or if you have questions for Todd as well, feel free to throw them again in the, the chat or the Q&A uh, and we'll hopefully have a few minutes here at the end. Uh, my next guest I want to bring on for a second is Ross Evelsizer. 
Uh, Ross works for the Northeast Iowa Resource Conservation and Development Group, RCD, as we like to call them. Uh, Ross, I will let you take it away here for a couple minutes. I just want to point out that the work you're doing here as another young Iowan has been super important in relation to the environmental aspects, sort of as we look at heritage grains and growing them and what we can do with them to help improve our environment. So, Ross, take it away here for a few minutes. Appreciate it, Benji, and and um, happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So, um, you know, a lot of what I do at at uh, RCND um, is focused around um, around the environment and natural resource protection. That's actually my title as natural resources projects director. And a lot of what um, you know, what we're thinking about are landscape level solutions to larger issues of repeated flooding um, and water quality. Um, those have been issues for a long time in the state um, and in and, and the Midwest in general. Um, some a lot of the a lot of those flooding and water quality issues are derived from landscape changes that includes agriculture. Um, and so when we're thinking about a large watershed or a large area that we need to um, you know, alter the landscape, then um, we start looking at, at potential solutions within that. And and for Iowa, that means looking at our working lands. And that's sort of what has drawn me into thinking about um, how do we get cereal grains back on the landscape? Because Iowa is basically a two crop system at this point, completely commercialized. Um, it's corn and soybeans. And there's the, the mantra of feeding the world. Um, but a lot of that grain crop of corn and soybeans goes towards animal feed and um, oil production and, and ethanol. So we can get back towards um, some of the, the more fun things like like baking and um, beer production um, by integrating cereal grains. It also has a tremendous environmental impact. Um, cereal grains can be grown um, as part of a cover crop system, as Todd mentioned, um, but also, um, you know, they they can be out there through the winter months. Uh, there's several winter hardy varieties like cereal rye, um, winter wheat. Those can be planted following the harvest of corn or soybeans in the fall. And then they're present um, and they help to, to improve soil health and tie up nutrients in the soil so that uh, the soil is not washed away. The nutrients are washed away with them. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, uh, the the hypoxia zone in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of that is derived from, from nutrients that are applied to fields in Iowa. Um, one of the, the more unique things that we're looking at is instead of displacing some of those corn and soybean acres, um, we're trying to integrate cereal grains into um, those existing acres by doing multi-cropping, which is a challenge when we have a, essentially a, a shorter growing season than, than some parts of the world. Um, but what we're looking at specifically is uh, a lot of farmers are trying a practice called relay cropping, where a cereal grain, it works really well with cereal rye. It's planted in the fall, and then soybeans are planted directly into that crop in the spring. And you can see from the images here, there's an offset of two rows of cereal rye and then a single row of, of soybeans spaced 30 inches apart. Um, the cereal rye can actually be harvested by the combine right off the top of the soybeans. Uh, without damaging the soybean crop. Um, and then the soybeans are harvested in the fall, just like you normally would with soybeans. And so that allows the producer to do a couple things. For one thing, they're taking two crops off the field. Um, so they're able to basically add those two crops together and in their overall um, harvest and business plan. Um, it keeps everything covered. Uh, so a lot of environmental benefits. There's not a lot of inputs in terms of herbicides, pesticides in this system because it's sort of um, works on, in a more natural way. Um, and so that's a, that's one of the unique ways, I guess, that we're trying to integrate cereal grains back into the modern agricultural system. You know, essentially we're two, two generations away, as, as Benji mentioned, you know, and so a lot of this knowledge of growing cereal grains has kind of gone away. And so now we have a lot of producers that are interested in getting back to it. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of exciting things happen in terms of multi-cropping and other other efforts to get these cereal grains back into the system and maybe doing it in a little bit different way than, than our ancestors did. So I'll, that's probably where I'll stop. I'll let you, let you finish up and can answer questions later. Thank Great. you. 
Thank you, Ross. And I, I will point out again that, um, you know, Ross and Todd are both doing amazing work. Uh, and it's there are networks of folks across the country that are working on similar pieces. If this is of interest to you, or if you want to hear more about their work, by all means, reach out here and we'll give some info at the end uh, to myself or even Andrew, and we can connect you by all means. But again, just kind of pointing out that heritage grains can provide a lot of different things. So we're talking about soil and water health, increased conservation practices, uh, carbon footprint benefits. You know, we're looking at crops that actually sink carbon. They can actually absorb CO2 back into the earth. Some of those things are really interesting. We also are going to increase local food varieties, uh, artisan products, high quality things that we're talking about, you know, really high quality grains uh, that can also be a very high profit product for a smaller producer to grow. Uh, so those are really beneficial opportunities if we can if we can suss them out. Uh, again, opportunities for local egg producers and processors, and then also just a renewed sense of purpose and community. Just even in the conversations we've had over the last couple of years about you know these heritage grains and things, it's amazing. Uh, I would have never met Todd probably necessarily, I can't say outside of this conversation. And uh, he's somebody I really enjoy getting to talk with. Uh, Ross and I are kind of the same way. We work in different projects together, but people just doing really interesting work. And of course, that leads right into other opportunities. Um, so opportunities that exist for creating some of these markets, of course, uh, local food inroads. Uh, right here in Northeast Iowa, we have a project called the Iowa Food Hub. There are projects like this all across the US that are connecting uh, producers to to consumers. So right outside of the grocery store, these are people who actually go out onto the farms, get the food product and resell them. Uh, so those are opportunities. Bakeries across the country, across the U.S. right now, and of course, across the world, but across the U.S. right now are seeing a huge interest in these heritage grains, baking with varieties of grains that are grown in specific parts of the U.S. and using them either locally or telling the stories of those grains to kind of help this whole movement along. Breweries are another example. We love breweries uh, and distilleries as well. So a couple, of, I'm going to fly through a couple of examples of those here just in the next couple of slides. We're going to wrap up and let you ask a few questions as as well. I always have to mention Pulpit Rock Brewing right here in Decorah. Full disclosure, I also work part-time at Pulpit Rock. Uh, but Pulpit over the last two years has taken on a project called the Dreaming of Fields Project. They've actually gone out of their way to source some of these heritage grains that are being grown right here in Northeast Iowa by small producers. Those are everything from open uh, pollinated varieties of corn to some different types of heritage grains, some wheat or uh, barley that have been uh, grown here in Iowa, creating different series of small small batch beers for those. Rock Filter Distillery in Spring Grove, Minnesota, just up the road in uh, Norwegian Ridge, as it was once called. Uh, Rock Filter is one of two, I believe, certified farm, uh, farm to sip distilleries in uh, Minnesota, or at least when they started, they were. They grow organic grains right outside of Spring Grove, Minnesota. They're brought into the distillery and turned into uh, incredible distilled beverages. So another really neat uh, piece. Uh, a fun piece of that puzzle also is the Myra family. Christian Myra is the distiller there in uh, Long Roots in, uh, in Spring Grove. Now, when we were talking about milling earlier, one of the best examples from right here in the Midwest we have is a, a company, a farm called Meadowlark uh, Organics or Meadowlark Community Mill. They're just over in eastern Wisconsin, or in western Wisconsin, east of here, I apologize, but in western Wisconsin, Ridgeway, uh, and they are actually growing their own grains, but more importantly, they have created a new artisan mill. Essentially, the old mills like we saw a picture of, they have created a brand new mill like that that's a community mill. What they're able to do is take smaller amounts of grains that are being grown in the region, turn them into artisan products, package them, and source them out through the Midwest. Beautiful products, really high-end, beautiful grains that are being grown by small producers all across from uh, Western Minnesota to uh, Wisconsin and in between. So uh, a great family story in Meadowlark. I encourage you to look them up and learn a little bit more. One other fun example right here in Decorah, just in the last year or two, we have a very talented baker here in town, Phil Janky Stour and his wife. Uh, and Phil has done a couple different projects in Decorah. His latest is called Little Dog or Little Saturday, I believe is the translation roughly. Uh, and it's a stack bar. It's a food cart, uh, a, a food truck as such. Phil bakes beautiful Scandinavian rye breads and the product he serves out of his food truck are essentially s'more bread or open face sandwiches. Uh, again, he's using rye uh, flour from Meadowlark Mill just over in Wisconsin. 
So locally grown flowers that are being used in a product that's being used in a food truck, really, you know, just full circle uh, and creating on local producers there, beautiful produce in season from around here and just doing a really neat job uh, and tie in, of course, to those Scandinavian uh, ancestors and some of those touches. The last uh, organization I'll talk about right here in the upper Midwest is the Artisan Grain Collaborative. Uh, the AGC is doing just incredible work uh, based over in Madison, Wisconsin, but really doing an incredible job of teaching and connecting a lot of folks that are interested in this artisan grain or this heritage grain conversation. Uh, again, talking about seeds, you're talking about soil uh, and how these things make their way from being grown to being processed to being enjoyed. Uh, and Artisan Grain Collaborative doing just an incredible job of connecting a lot of those dots. Um, so one of my last slides, I'm just going to point out one of the best ways you can get involved in this if you're interested are just trying out a few things. If you have a favorite recipe, a cookie recipe, a waffle recipe, something Something else, ask your local grocer or your food co-op if they carry any regional flowers, any of these products like we're talking about. And, uh, you know, if you have a favorite recipe, just substitute a little bit of one of those grains. If you can get some heritage flour, uh, some really beautiful, uh, you know, heritage wheat flour or something like that, give it a little try. Maybe substitute a quarter cup or a half cup in, in, uh, in one of your recipes. Don't be afraid to experiment. Again, I've, I've had a lot of ups and downs and uh, my family's eaten most of them still. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I will say a lot of these grains react differently. So if you're looking at heritage grain flours, they react differently than when you would expect out of a five pound bag of flour that you bring home from the grocery store. Uh, they're really beautiful products, uh, but they take a little bit of patience uh, and they can add a lot of flavor and interest into uh, the things you might be uh, working on. And uh, again, I'll also just mention, look for more upcoming opportunities through Vesterheim. Uh, we've got a lot of amazing regional resources here. Again, I mentioned a few of these, a couple of the other regional resources. Uh, Breadtopia, just here in Iowa, Fairfield, Iowa, offers up amazing resources for craft baking uh, and artisan baking resources with lo local grains. Early Morning Harvest is another company uh, over in Panora, Iowa, a farm. They're doing an amazing job, have been for several years of growing their own grains and processing them into flowers. Some really unique pieces there. Bakersfield Flour in Minneapolis is another example of a local mill that is uh, sourcing grains that are regionally grown and producing those into really beautiful products. Great River Organic Milling in Cochrane, Wisconsin. They have a little bigger reach. You might find those in a few of your box stores. Great River has a little bigger distribution, a little bigger system at this point. The Iowa Food Hub we mentioned here in Decorah. And then I just want to mention your local food cooperative, whatever part of the country you live in, it's probably one of your better local resources to find out more if, if these products are available or in your area already. Right here in Decorah, we're super fortunate to have the Onyota Food Co-op uh, over in Barocco, Wisconsin. The Barocco Co-op does an incredible job of handling a lot of these products. The Bluff Country Co-op in Winona, Minnesota being another regional one right here that uh, often handles a lot of these types of things. So we've covered an immense amount of information in a pretty short amount of time here. Uh, this is my contact info on the screen, and I think I'll let Andrew jump back in and see if we have any uh, questions we can pan answer here uh, before we wrap up. Absolutely. First of all, just a huge thank you, Benji. This has been fascinating. Um, really, really lovely to get to have you here sharing this information and to get to have Rod, Roth and Todd here also. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that came in is that there was a renewed interest in bread baking during the pandemic. And the person who submitted this question asked, what, if any, changes happened or are happening in the bread and grain landscape from this recent time with the increase in home bakers? That is a fantastic, uh, fantastic question. And I would point out that I think a lot of people are aware that there was sort of a sourdough boom during the pandemic, uh, which is actually a really wonderful thing. As we pointed out in sort of the, the very quick 5,000 years of history that we covered, everything that was baked in history was uh, essentially, if it was a leavened bread, came from some type of a natural fermentation, a sourdough as we know it. Um, so any knowledge base in that is really helpful. I think that interest and that explosion during the pandemic has led to a lot more conversations about these heritage grains. Lots of other parts of our food system have already experienced some of these conversations. Everybody knows they can go to a farmer's market and buy um, beautiful vegetables in whatever season of the part of the country you live in, right? Uh, but you don't always think about where grains come from. You know, where did my bag of flour come from? What kind of grain was this uh, milled from? And where did it come from? Could it be grown in my part of the country? And uh, could that be a part of my local food system? So I think if anything, it's really given a lot of uh, thought and conversation to that. And of course, bread making in the U.S., I think is just, uh, is really, 
really just experiencing a renaissance. Uh, we have so many younger chefs uh, and, and pastry folks who are baking just incredible bread across the U.S. Uh, and that is something our country uh, has not always experienced, especially outside of the major cities. So it's really encouraging to see that um, across the country. Yeah. Great. Another question that came in, Deb is wondering, are any of the heritage grains gluten free that you can recommend? That's a wonderful question. So um, this conversation always breaks off into a couple of things. If you're truly celiac, uh, I always uh, offer you to use a, a caution in this conversation, because if you're truly celiac uh, and you have those reactions, you need to be careful. That said, yes, a lot of these grains are actually um, products, they can turn into products that most folks who are celiac sensitive can use. Um, you know, rye as an example is, can be a little complicated to work with, to bake with, but, uh, is a very low gluten product. It's not gluten free necessarily, but it's a very low gluten product. Also, a lot of the ancient type grains, uh, when you look into things, uh, like kamut or even into, uh, other, uh, types of heritage wheat, um, they're just, they're, they're a different makeup than what our modern varieties of wheat are. So a lot of folks who are gluten sensitive are able to use those types of wheat. Now, again, if you're true celiac, a little bit of caution there with, with some of those things, but there are a lot of resources out there. Um, and, and, you know, and there are some amazing flowers being made in terms of like oat flowers and other things too, that have really come to a, a much more better place, much more palatable place than they used to. Um, when I was at grindstone bakery in California, we had an enormous amount of wheat sensitive folks. And again, this is back in 2000, this is 20 some years ago who came to us for our breads because they could eat them. Not only were they naturally fermented, uh, but we were using grains that were just a lot more friendly to the system. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. I think we have time for just a couple more. Greg, do you want to throw Lori's question to Benji? Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, how are the heritage grains doing with the effects of uh, climate change? Are hardier grains being developed that will stay in the effects of climate change? Yeah, you know, if if uh, Todd or Ross want to jump in there, they're welcome to. But what I will say is, I think one of the most exciting parts of this conversation is that by looking a little bit back in history, we can see varieties that maybe went out of interest for very specific reasons. Um, maybe that was insect pressure. Maybe that was environmental change at that time, you know, decades or a hundred years ago. At this point in time, we're actually looking at some of those varieties to bring back into the picture because they have benefits that a lot of our modern varieties have lost uh, with breeding and with, uh, you know, the advancement of, of being able to grow more grain uh, with sort of modern grain varieties, which is, again, not a bad thing, but we've lost even sometimes we actually lose some of those beneficial things. Sometimes we gain them right through through that's kind of a whole other conversation through through seed breeding and some of those things. But uh, it, so it's interesting to look at. And in terms of environmental change and crop growing, of course, that changes across the U.S. Uh, Todd, I see you pop up. If you want to if you want to speak to that, you're welcome to. Um, yeah, sure. Sure, Benji. Yeah, I, I was just going to chime in. Rye has traditionally been a green that's been grown under tough conditions, low fertility, droughty, and it still can give a fairly good yield. Um, one of the things with climate change and small grains, as you get warmer and more humid, you'll run into more fungal problems with the heads, uh, the head scab, that kind of thing. And as soon as you start getting that, you start running into problems producing food grade flour because you have too much vomitoxin levels in those flowers. So uh, as we go warmer and wetter, it may get more challenging for the small grains. Repeat. Thank you. All right. Brigitte Mead has been experimenting on a garden scale with growing grains ranging from winter wheats, barley, rye, and triticale, and also with no success so far, perennial wheat. Mm. Said that some are very difficult to hand process, like triticale, and some are very easy, like barley. Some end up going to the chicken, and some get ground into flour with varied success. Do you know of folks out there who have suggestions on garden scale grain growing? Yeah, I love this question. Thank you. Uh, so I have done some garden scale growing with some wheat just in my backyard right here in Decorah in town. Uh, and I've loved it. Um, milling on your own, I will be the first to admit, can be pretty complicated. Uh, it really depends. And there is a lot of art 
uh, in the process of milling. Uh, so it's really encouraging to me when I see organizations or farms like Meadowlark that I mentioned over in Western Wisconsin, there is a trend amongst farmers to see more of those small artisan mills. And sometimes even we're seeing bakeries set up to mill their own flowers with some really, really neat processing techniques, but there's a lot of art to it. So it can be really fun to, to work with. Um, I agree the variations of success really do depend. Uh, the perennial grains, some of the perennial grasses like Todd was speaking to earlier, the Kernza. Um, again, it's a variety of grass. So what you're dealing with is truly a seed off of the grass instead of you know what, what we would really call a grain necessarily. But they're really different and really, really interesting to work with. Different flavors, different varieties. And again, the flowers you're going to get out of those without going into too technical of a conversation are all going to be different as well. They all react differently. Depends on how dry they are when you mill them. It depends on what those little pieces look like. And if you do any... Um, uh, sorting to those right to or any sifting um but it's a really fun process and uh, i would love to follow up on that conversation anytime yeah those are Great. those are really fun things to try and then i think the last question we'll throw to you is do you know of anybody in norway who is currently growing heirloom grains and sharing the seed oh wow okay so i will say i i do know from a handful of conversations that international seed sharing can um <laughs> Auto answer this on a recording can be a little complicated. <laughs> uh, you may want to use some caution in trying to do such things, uh, depending on what agencies are paying attention. <laughs> but uh, certainly, this is happening across Europe. Norway is come to the table. Cuisine and cult, you know, Norway's culinary scene has changed. Oh my goodness, so quickly and so immensely, even even the last ten years. Um, and I will say, Norway has come full circle as as a culinary. And again, I don't I don't pretend to be an expert, but like from a culinary sense, are exploring so many more things very specific to Norway and Scandinavia, but really to the country itself, and just working on incredible locals of level. So I can't give you a specific name off the top of my head, but absolutely, the scene is alive and well in Norway. Um, bread culture in Norway is a little bit different. Scandinavian breads are a little bit different, but you know that idea of fresh bread in Norway, to, to not have a fresh bread daily, it doesn't compute, right? It doesn't, that's not how they work. And so when you travel in Norway, when you are in Norway, fresh bread is available everywhere. And it's a really beautiful thing. Tons of multi-grain uses, uh, heritage grains, different things in a lot of what's going on there. That said, Norway still is very limited in their agricultural growing, right? So they're not a huge wheat producing country. It's a little hard to grow wheat there still, uh, but plenty of sources regionally. Uh, but some of the grains they can grow are amazing. And of course, rye breads uh, being at the top of the list of just really exquisite and beautiful, beautiful examples. So I would love to come up with a couple more uh, specific examples and share them if uh, anybody wants to reach out. But yeah. 